students. Uh, sorry for late, we are not only 20 minutes late uh, due to our teacher, Abhilasan Khan Choudhury. Uh, Dr. Khalikun Jaman sir, uh, SE course of Dhaka Medical College Hospital, he is an excellent clinician and also teacher. Uh, he will talk most important topic, evaluation of cardiac patient or non-cardiac surgery. Also, Vadu sir, a few comments on this topic. Uh, as uh, Dr. Mosin stated, this is a very important topic. Very often, we as cardiologists are asked to provide a comment or a guide guidance or a dictate the medicine that should be taken or changed for a patient who has cardiac problem and need to undergo a non-cardiac surgery. Depending on the situation, the facilities available, the type of surgery, the underlying condition of the patient, it may be a very simple decision, it may be a very complex decision. We need to have a quite clear knowledge about the whole thing to guide the surgeons about the feasibility, about the safety, about the probable adverse problem that can uh, the anesthetist and the surgeon can encounter. So this topic is very important. Let us go to the lecture to find out what Dr. Khalikun Jaman has to offer us regarding this very uh, important topic. Uh, Khalikun uh, Jaman, sir, share your scene, please. Thank you. Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury for a very nice uh, beginning uh, comments about the topics of the today. Basically, this is one of the chapters in the cardiac textbook which remain majority of the time a least readed part on the part of the students before appearing in the examination. Before it is important for reading exam, but there is little scope to ask in the clinical examination and there is uh, little scope to ask in the viva exam. But which is very much important, which the Professor Abdul Wabid Choudhury sir said that it is very much important in practical life. However, wherever you are, you may be a clinical cardiologist, you may be an interventional cardiologist or an electric physiologist. You have to face this practical problem in your day to day life. So, the proper knowledge, proper skill, and the uh, extensive updated information should be required to prepare a patient for non-cardiac surgery who is, who is suffering from cardiac disease or suspected to have cardiac diseases. Respected teachers, also the respected teacher, Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury, he is also the director of ITDI and Dr. Moshin Ahmed. My respected teachers here, ex-director and professor, uh, ex-director and professor, Nuzrul Islam sir, Abdullah Shafi Mojundar sir, and the other senior teachers in front of me. And the students in my country and the abroad. Welcome to you all to our today's lecture. Uh, I have arranged this lecture on the outline of beginning from introduction to incidence and definitely that should be objective what we're going to do for the patient and we have to calculate the risks before calculation why there is risk we have to find out that causes and we have to find out some risk models we have to calculate the surgical risks we have to follow the guidelines for Preoperative consultation, assess the functional capacity, which is very much vital for assessing the perioperative adverse cardiac events. And we have to do some tests accordingly, not all the tests, because the test does not provide very much fruitful in uh, uh, predicting the perioperative cardiac outcome. Rather, sometimes it will produce unnecessary delay of the surgery. And then we have to find out our management approach. And accordingly, we have to reschedule or readjust the pharmacotherapy or addition of some pharmacological agents that may uh, reduce the incidence of the perioperative cardiac events. And we have to definitely, mode of anesthesia, we have to decide after talking with the anesthesiologist and the surgeon. And lastly, I have got conclusion. Uh, into many patients undergoing non cardiac surgery uh, has an adverse cardiac outcome. The risk is related to the patient and surgery specific characteristic. 
more than 50% of the perioperative deaths are related to cardiac events. You see that a lot of causes, a lot of percentages of the patient develop cardiac events. And the most occur within the 72 hours of the surgery. And the most perioperative myocardial infarction present atypically, this has to be remembered always by the cardiologist. And what is the magnitude of the problem in the worldwide? In, 19, uh, in 2018, number of general surgical procedures performed worldwide was about 60 million, which is likely to grow 3.6% per year. And the non-cardiac surgery is associated with overall complication rate of about 7 to 11%, overall mortality rate as high as 1.5%, and the cardiac complication rate at about 42 percent. Perioperative MI, MI incidence 1.4 percent and the cardiac death may be as high as 1 percent which is more than overall mortality uh, more than 50 percent than overall mortality of 1.5 percent. So the magnitude of the problem is very high. So, so we have some objectives before that going into going into details examination of the patient and findings his disease pattern and calculating his risk we have to find out first objective what we should going to do for the patient is it the surgeon refer the patient for clearance for surgery is it so simple basically not like that when the patient come to us for referral they said the surgeon sent to me that you will give the clearance and you will do the surgery basically things are not like that First, when the patient comes to you, you first establish the overall risk of the surgical procedure which is going to be done, establish the cardiovascular risk of the individual patient, decide if any testing is needed to further define the risk, and advise the patient accordingly on the benefit risk of the surgical procedure, adjustment of the medication as needed, and which is most important but neglected part is communication between a surgeon anesthesiologist, cardiologist, and in certain cases, family physician, and ultimately playing the mode of the anesthesia appropriate to the cardiac status. So why there is perioperative risk? Why these surgeries uh, so much uh, producing a risk for the patient? Definitely stress and anxiety, and talking with the patient, and the, uh, talking about the risk, benefit of the procedure, Details about the procedure may alleviate the stress and anxiety of the patient and may relieve some sorts of cardiac complication even. So it is very important. If it happens like that, that on the operating table, the patient is lying on the operating table and the doctors or surgeon enters into the operation theater and the patient is telling to the surgeon that I am very scared and this is my first operation, so I am very scared. If the surgeon told that don't worry, it's mine too, then how magnitude of the stress and anxiety the patient will have. So before going the surgery, we have to sit with the patient, to discuss cons and corner of this procedure and the risk and his, uh, how we could how we can minimize the risk. We have to discuss with the patient. That can reduce much of the stress and anxiety. Only the stress and anxiety is not the main factor. Trauma pain that will ultimately lead to a surge of catecholamine. Bleeding may happen in surgical procedure, inherent complication as a part of that. May we have anemia, may have anesthetic complication, intubation related complication, inflammation, hypothermia, and the anesthetic process as a whole is a hypercoagulable state. And the fluid shift and the electrolyte balance, fluid shift is more occurred in case of vascular surgical procedure. So all these factors acting concertly may induce a complex pathophysiological response that may ultimately lead to the patient to adverse cardiovascular outcome. So we have to consider all these factors before deciding the patient to go to undergo surgical procedure. So what should be done? Proper management, no doubt. Proper management the main, should be the main issue. So when the patient comes to you, is it very different from managing the patient other than the before consulting or before managing the patient for uh, surgical procedure? Basically, no. If you question yourself, how would I manage this patient in the absence of a surgical procedure in question? 
that will give you the guidelines. Essentially, for comprehensive management of the care, let us follow the guidelines. And what are those guidelines? In 2040, American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association give the guideline, and at the same year, European Society of Cardiology also give the guideline on the management issue of the patient going to cardiac uh, non-cardiac surgery having the patient with cardiac problem. So, why what the guideline recommends? Guideline recommends a full-fledged preoperative consultation, which will focus on patient cardiovascular status comprehensive physical cardiovascular examination, review of the available pertinent data, consideration of the comorbid disorders, including clinical risks, surgical risks of the patient, and the vital one is determination of the functional status of the individual, and adjunct testing if needed, consideration of the perioperative medical therapy. So with the, all this aim and objectives, we have to consult with the patient. And how we calculate the risks? Because the risk calculation is vital, so that we can minim we can take the measures to reduce the risk. So, what are those risk models we used to follow? Several risk indices has been developed during the last 30 years by Goldman et al., Dead Square et al., and Lee Man et al. The Lee index has been incorporated or has been recommended by European Society of Cardiology as a risk indicator and also the American Society of Cardiology. And we'll discuss on that later on. And other risk models are American College of Surgeons National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, Surgical Risk Calculator, and American College of Surgeons NSQRP MICA. These are very complicated, complex, needs a lot of data. But for practical purpose, revised cardiac risk index is a, a more important one to calculate the clinical risk of the patient. What is that? This is, you see, the European Society of Cardiology and American College of Cardiology recommend that should have some risk model to identify the risk of the, risk of the patient, clinical risk of the patient, before going to non-surgical procedure. The revised cardiac risk index is a simple, validated, accepted tool to assess the perioperative major cardiac events, myocardial infarction, pulmonary edema, ventricular fibrillation, or primary cardiac arrest, and complete heart growth. What are those risk factors you see on the left side? On left side, it tells the number of risk factors on the left and the scoring on the right side. Cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, congestive heart failure, renal impairment, creatinine more than two milligrams per deciliter, diabetes mitosis, requiring insulin, and high risk surgery, supraingenal vascular surgery, particularly. These are each will have one number score. On the right side of the table, you see that the more the clinical risk factors, more is the mortality. When the risk factor is more than T3, the mortality may raise up to 18% even. So you see the magnitude uh, by RCRI, you can calculate the mortality risk or the patient adverse period or adverse cardiovascular outcome you can assess very perfectly and very uh, more or less precisely. Next, we can assess the clinical risk of the patient. Next, we have to decide the surgical risk. Surgical risk basically depends on the type of the surgery, nature of the surgery, and the timing of the surgery. What are those low risk surgery, intermediate risk surgery, high risk surgery? Low risk surgery considered low situation or surgical procedure where the patient has got less than 1% risk of development of myocardial infarction and the death. These are endoscopic procedures particularly endoscopic polypectomy, superficial procedure over the skin, even the plastic surgical procedure, cataract surgery, breast surgery, ambulatory surgery, and the laparoscopic surgery, where there is no need to open the abdomen. These are low-risk surgical procedure. And the intermediate risk surgical procedure is defined, those cases, where the patient has got 1.5%, 1.5% risk of development of myocardial infarction and death, these are most common surgical procedures are fallen into this group. Carotid end arterectomy, head and neck surgery, interperitoneal surgery, interthoracic surgery, orthopedic surgery, prosthetic surgery, urological surgery, and gynecological surgery. Even. RX surgery, definitely this in this high risk category, more than 5% mortality rate. And in this category, there's those procedures where the patient need longer time uh, for completion of the procedure like pulmonary and liver transplantation, pneumonectomy, total cystectomy, 
even deep seated abdominal surgeries are also falling into, into this categorization, particularly deep renal pancreatic surgery and bile duct surgery. So let us see how time frame affects the surgical needs. Is it emergent surgery? Is it urgent? Is it time sensitive? Or is it elective? Because when there is emergent surgical procedure is in front, then you have to neglect all the uh, cardiac diseases at that time. So this uh, degree of timing or timing of the surgery will also determine the outcome. Emergent surgery is defined as when the life or limb is threatened, if not in operating room within six hours. And urgent is defined as when it is not within six to 24 hours. Time sensitive is when delay of one to six weeks for further evaluation would neg negatively affect the outcomes. And elective can be delayed for up to one year. So we are more comfortable with elective surgical procedure and the emergent or urgent surgical procedures always carries a high risk surgical procedures. So all uh, we determine the clinical risks, determine the cardiac risks, then we have to determine the functional capacity. This is one of the single most important parameter that will determine the outcome. What is that? Functional capacity is defined on the basis of the mats. And mats, how can you assess the mats? Mats can be assessed by Duke activity status index and by activities to perform daily activities of the living. And if needed, we can do exercise tolerance tests to further assess the risks. So you see the Duke activity status in this. And a lot of activities, daily activities are there, beginning from mild activities so up to outdoor sports, even football playing or tennis playing like that. So on the left side, the activities are written. On the right side, there is scoring system. You see the scoring, scoring system. In deep activity score, score diff, uh, begin from zero up to 58 plus. A dash score of 35 is a threshold for identification of the patient at risk. And it corresponds to functional capacity of five mats. Next. We can assess the functional capacity by activities of the daily living. And this is the most important one. We can, practic we can practically implicate this in our day-to-day -day practice. When the patient can do the light activities and the whole it, house, it is one, one mess around. And who, when he or she can do much strenuous form of sports or exercise, like single tennis, football, basketball, skiing, swimming, these will more than 10 minutes. And in between, these are four to five minutes or four to seven minutes. Climbing one flight of stairs, walk on the level of the ground at a speed of four meters per second, running for a short distance, scrubbing, moving heavy furniture, and so on. These are categorized as person having four to five mats functional capacity. A, this group of patient is very important. Then according to that, we can classify the patient on four functional capacity, moderate, good, excellent. More the number of the mats, Greater is the outcome or lesser is the complication. The lower is the mats, poor is the outcome, and more is the incidence of the cardiovascular incident uh, complication. And in this format, we have to keep more importance on the moderate functional capacity of four to six mats, which is considered to be adequate or satisfactory functional capacity in the background of surgical procedure. And so to determine that, we can ask two simple questions to the patient that will give the patients, give the patient functional capacity estimation. Can you walk four blocks without stopping because of limiting symptoms? Can you climb two flights of stairs without stopping because of limiting symptoms? An affirmative answer to either of these questions confirms an adequate functional capacity that corresponds to four to five nights. And this is very important. So it is said that the more the blocks a person can uh, walk or more the flights the person can climb, more is the functional capacity and less is the incidence of cardiovascular complication. So the activities, why this four to five minutes is so much vital or important for uh, assessment uh, of the functional capacity because the activities referring to an exertional tolerance to four, four to five minutes, which is typically equivalent to physiological stress of most non-cardiac surgical procedures requiring general anesthesia. So I, I want to repeat in this point, activities referring to an exertional tolerance of four to five minutes, 
This is typically equivalent to physiological stress of most of non-cardiac surgical procedure requiring canine anesthesia. So these parameters is very vital. So we have to keep it in our memory before deciding the uh, risk stratification for this patient. So if the patient has got adequate or functional, uh, moderate functional capacity without any cardiovas, without any RCRI, then you proceed for surgery. If the patient has got functional capacity more than, less than four, then you have to think about further uh, testing to identify the risks and take the steps accordingly so that you can minimize the risks for the patient who is undergoing non-cardiac surgery. So what are the tests you have to advocate? You know all the name of the test, beginning from ECG, echocardiography, stress test, biomarker, CT coronary angiogram, cardiovascular, magnetic resonance imaging, and cardiac catheterization, and so on, coronary angiogram. We have to know that all the tests are not required for a patient for assessment of the cardiovascular risks. Rather, we have to rationalize our decision process, what to do or what to not to do. Because sometimes unnecessary testing may delay the surgical procedure and may throw the patient to unnecessary risks. So we have to rationalize, we have to be more judicious before taking the decision, what I have to do, what I need to do, and what the patient need to have. So you see, the routine preoperative 12-bit disease is not recommended routinely, but can be useful as a baseline in patient to have who have cardiovascular disease, who have cerebrovascular disease, who have peripheral arterial disease, and who have a known structural heart disease. But no consistent evidence that ECG abnormalities are prognostic of the outcomes. So you see the recommendation made by two guidelines. You first see the three. The preoperative ECG is not recommended for patients who have no risk factor and are scheduled for low risk surgery. And on the right side, you see the recommendation made by the American College of Cardiology that routine preoperative breast control disease is not useful for asymptomatic patient undergoing low risk surgery procedure. So sometimes this investigation may uh, falsely misguided us to another way. So ECG is only indicated for those patients who have risk factors and are scheduled for intermediate high risk surgery or the patient has got symptoms related to cardiovascular disease. Echocardiography, again, routine preoperative evaluation of the LV function is not recommended and all, only recommended in those situations where a patient have got symptoms of the heart failure, suddenly his symptoms become deteriorated, or patient has got abnormal ECG without any previous workup, work up, or the patient has got known structural heart disease or there is suspicion of the structural heart disease. And one of the parameter of the echocardiography is ejection fraction, so it will it will give us an idea about the uh, outcome of the patient in the perioperative period. Less, are, less than 35% ejection fraction. Those patients who have, will have more of an adverse perioperative cardiovascular outcome. You see the uh, recommendation made by European, who we have already discussed. Next, come to biomarkers. Biomarkers like BNP, NTPO, BNP, TROPI, and CRP estimation is an approach to identify the patient at high risk. But preoperative routine biomarker sampling for risk stratification and to prevent cardiac events is not recommended. Furthermore, there are no data that suggest that targeting these biomarkers, the treatment and intervention will not reduce the perioperative risk. So these are troponin. We're not going in details about that. Anti BNP, pro BNP, those patients who have got incipient heart failure or those patients who have got previously diagnosed heart failure, you can do. But management to target the numbers does not improve the outcome. You see the recommendation made by both Society of Cardiology that on the left side, you see the European Society of Recommendation assessment of the cardiac proponents in high risk patients, both before and 48 to 72 hours after major surgery may be considered. It is to be indication. Anti-proviant is also like that, to be indication. So stress testing, routine screening and stress testing is not useful, not recommended. Recommended in those cases where the patient will undergo high risk surgery and the patient has got unknown functional capacity or having four functional less than four functional capacity or 
revised cardiac risk index is more than two. What are those stress tests you know all about? The exercise test and the pharmacological stress test. Again, ECG based or imaging based stress test. Physical exercise using a treadmill or bicycle ergometer provides an added estimation of the functional capacity apart from diagnosing the uh, ischemic heart disease by observing the HTT segment abnormalities. Pharmacological stress test, as you know, that is preferred for those cases where patient has got limited exercise capacity or pre existing ECG abnormalities at rest. You see the stress test. Stress test where the patient has got more 7 to 10 meds, functional capacity, low risk of perioperative cardiovascular event, less than 4 increases. Can also detect in myocardial ischemia, ischemia when it is detected at low workload, there is high risk of perioperative outcome. If it is detected within the high workload, less is the pericardial uh, cardiovascular complication. And one thing important, the electrocardiographic changes with exercise are not as predictive as functional capacity. So it should be uh, kept in mind. But this is a recommendation. Stress MPI or stress PET stress, these have got strong negative predictive value. Fixed perfusion defect increases greater risk uh, than the normal scan. And patient having more extensive reversible defect, moderate to severe, Reversible defect, more than 20% of the myocardium, if it is involved, then it, in, it indicates more uh, incidence, more uh, chance of development of perioperative cardiovascular adverse events. Stress echo provides this uh, information not only the LV function at rest and the other structures of the heart, like heart valve abnormalities, presence and the extent of stress in this ischemia. At the same time, it can provide a good insight about the viability of the myocardium. In general, it has got a high predictive value, 90 to 100%. However, the positive predictive value is around 45%. So it is a very uh, good test in terms of specificity and the sensitivity in compared to other stress tests. And during the perioperative period, as the patients are relatively elder age group and have got certain other non-cardiovascular morbidities, so patient, little, uh, patient cannot work more, patient has limited uh, exercise tolerance. So in those cases, stress echo is the best one for assessing the function, uh, for assessing the cardiovascular uh, disease problems of this patient because it can provide insight about the structural abnormalities as well as provides information about the ischemia and also viability of the myocardium. Uh, so stress echo is also available in our country it is done in different government as well as uh, private hospital, including BSMMU and Hata Medical College Hospital. So recommendation is like that. I want to uh, utter one thing, the class three, imaging stress testing is not recommended before low risk surgery, regardless of the patient clinical risk. So should not be performed, every patient should perform. Why are the patient has got more than two clinical risk factors and the poor functional capacity less than four meds. So cardiovascular resonance imaging, I'm not going in detail about that because there's no or limited data available in the setting of pre-operative risk stratification. But theoretically, it is very sensitive to test in terms of diagnosis of the structural heart disease, coronary artery disease, coronary artery disease, and the patient perfusion, wall motion, and viability, all this like that. CT angiogram, currently there is no or limited data available in the setting of pre-operative risk stratification. Hardly can add any additive value in the decision making. Can be done for exclusion of the coronary artery disease in patients who are at risk for atherosclerosis. So it can be done. At the same time, the calcium scoring can give us also a rough estimation about the probability of having cardiovascular risk as well as cardio coronary artery disease. So it can be done while it is indicated. But there is no even there is no large scale data to recommend. Coronary angiogram or cardiac catheterization. Indication for preoperative coronary angiography and revascularization are similar in the non surgical setting. So it is not like that the patient has come for uh, clearance for surgery, so I have to do angiogram finally. No, 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 like that. But the indications are as like as non surgical setting. So cardiac catheterization does not have a role in preoperative risk assessment except a small subset of the patient. 
and coronary revascularization should not be performed solely to reduce the operative risk for another procedure and has not proven to be beneficial in control clinical trial. So it has to be remembered. But if it is indicated, then do the revascularization before the procedure, but not for reducing the perioperative adverse outcome. So you see the indication, I'm not, these are the indications which commonly uh, we used to learn or is taught you. So you have coming all with all these investigations, clinical history, physical examination, functional capacity assessment, and investigation, you already come to a diagnosis. So you will, then you will proceed for management of the patient if it needs to be. But before going to management, you have to uh, go through the patient mm -hmm. in details. Every constant corner of the patient's data uh, should be properly uh, scrutinized to give the decision. So what are the management approach? The other two approach that has been also uh, recommended by the guidelines, stepwise approach and disease specific approach. What is the stage of stepwise approach? You see the steps that has been recommended by American College of Cardiology. And you see the steps that has been recommended by European Society of Cardiology is more or less same. You see, I will go on stepwise, you'll see that these two are same. And these are particularly true for, for the patient who is suffering from suspected coronary artery disease. But before going into the stepwise approach, you have to know the answers of the following questions. Does the patient need emergency surgery? So decision will depend on that. Does the patient have the active cardiac condition? We'll go later on on this active cardiac condition. Is the surgery a low risk or a high risk or intermediate risk? Does the patient has got satisfactory functional capacity without symptom? Does the patient have clinical risk factor? Is the medical therapy, particularly beta blocker, is indicated for the patient? Now come to the steps. Does the patient need emergency non-cardiac surgery? If the answer is yes, then no need to delay. Go to the operating room. But important here is that there should have intraoperative and the postoperative vigilant surveillance for this patient with postoperative risk stratification and risk factor management so that we cannot uh, endanger the patient with cardiovascular outcomes. Okay. If the answer is no, that patient does not need emergency non cardiac surgery, then search for active cardiac condition. What are those? Does the patient have myocardial infarction within 30 days? If the patient is suffering from unstable angina, if the patient is suffering from severe angina, like plus three or plus four angina, if the patient has decompensated heart failure, significant arrhythmia, severe valvular heart disease. So stop here, think about, assess the patient, evaluate the patient, and treat accordingly guidelines. And then, after stabilization of the patient, go to the operating room. If the patient has got no non-cardiac surgery, no active cardiac condition, and the surgery is a low risk one, proceed with planned surgery. But if the patient has got uh, low risk surgery, but there is no low risk surgery, surgery are high or high risk or intermediate risk surgery, but a good functional capacity, equivalent to four or five minutes, then proceed with surgery. If the patient has functional capacity has got less than four minutes, then you have to think and think what can be done for reducing the perioperative outcome. You may need to have need some in, need to help of the certain investigation. But if there is no clinical risk factors, no need to do any investigation. Go for planned surgery. If the patient has got two, one or two clinical risk factors, and the patient will undergo intermediate or high risk surgery, then you can proceed with planned surgery with heart rate control, keeping in mind the perioperative adverse outcome, so that you can tackle the situation. But if the patient has three or more clinical risk factor and the patient is going to uh, undergo to vascular surgery, high risk surgery, intermediate surgery, then consider testing because it may change the management system. What are the clinical risk factors? Again, you see these are the IC, RC, RI risks, except diabetes mellitus repairing insulin. Otherwise, all the uh, clinical risks are as like as RC, RI risks. In step six, when you do the non insist stress test, those patients who has got less than four functional capacity and those patients who are undergoing high risk and intermediate risk surgery. If the uh, result of the test shows mild disease or moderate stress induced ischemia, proceed with surgery. If the patient has got extensive stress induced ischemia, then you may think of invasive procedure 
go for balloon angioplasty. You can do the surgery after two weeks. You can do the bare metal stent implantation if this coronary blockage. And you can do the surgery after four weeks or 30 days. If the surgery is elective one, you can delay the surgery. You can do a drug eluting stent implantation. And in certain cases, in mean, in mean to have a surgical procedure. So these are the stepwise approach. Now I, I will go on the disease specific approach. Uh, you see a list of disease, cardiovascular diseases are there. These are the common diseases which we frequently encounter in our day-to-day -day practice as well as in the hospital setting. Beginning from coronary artery disease to patient having cardiovascular implantable devices. So you have to very much uh, extensive and thorough knowledge about all, the, uh, about all the diseases here, including the management, so that you cannot miss anything uh, for the patient, so that you can advocate or recommend the correct thing. Uh, because nowadays uh, uh, of digitalization, everybody has got internet, gone through the internet, see the uh, different disease, uh, uh, disease pattern, they will uh, go through the papers and they will ask you several questions. So uh, if, you, and if you see such situation, if you face like that situation, the, the patient come to your chamber or the hospital office. I already diagnosed myself on the internet. I am only here for a second option. Then what can you do? You will be annoyed, no doubt. Patient seeing the internet, he can ask many irrelevant questions to you. That will make uh, that will make very irritable to you. But if you want to avoid this situation, you can do many things, but you have to be updated about your knowledge. So what I want to say we have to be very much updated about this management strategy. You can avoid the patient by telling or by making a signboard. Patient uh, will be extra charged for annoying the doctor with any self-diagnosis gotten off the internet. So you can avoid by this, but at the end, you have to know about all the things. So if the patient has coronary artery disease, depending on the uh, strategy of the patient uh, in which type of disease patient is suffering, has got angina, either unstable or stable, infarction, either HDMI, non-HDMI, either post-PCI, post-CVG, if the patient condition is stable and you do the risk stratification test, it shows the low risk status and normal result, procedure surgery, if the patient has got last three or four angina, high risk stress test, MPI 20, 30% uh, 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 of the myocardium is, uh, shows reversible defect, then postpone the surgery, reassess the patient, reinvestigate the patient, then accordingly treat. Systemic hypertension, although very common in the population, but as a part, systemic hypertension does not impose a very high risk for the patient in perioperative cardiovascular outcome determination. But in elective surgical procedure, it is better to do the surgery uh, when the blood pressure comes down to less than 140 to 90. But while to moderate hypertension, usually does not warrant delaying the procedure. You start your treatment and at the same time recommend for surgical procedure. But when the patient has got severe hypertension, more than 180 systolic and more than 110 diastolic should be controlled before operation is performed because it increases the perioperative cardiovascular complication. So you see the recommendation made by ESC. Now I am going to uh, valvular heart disease. As the incidence of rheumatic fever is more in our country, so rheumatic valvular heart disease are more in our population. So you have to see a varieties of combination of rheumatic valvular diseases in our patients. It increases the perioperative cardiovascular risk, no doubt, and risk is highly variable depending on the severity of the disease. Main issue, main issue or key issue is that you have to assess the severity of the alveolar lesion and you have to correlate the symptoms because symptoms determines the outcome in many, many of the cases. Left-sided valves provide more risk than the right-sided lesion. Stenotic lesion, more often irrigatant lesion. Symptomatic patient having more adverse perioperative cardiovascular outcome. Severe lesion definitely impose more risk and the patient who has LV dysfunction will provide more risk than patient having good LV function. 
So all in about mild to moderate degree of valvular heart disease can tolerate non-cardiac surgery, either stenotic lesion or regurgitant lesion. Asymptomatic patient may undergo elective non-cardiac surgery even with severe valvular heart disease with close perioperative monitoring. But consideration should be paid to those patients who are symptomatic, like severe aortic stenosis symptoms, consideration about balloon aortic valve lobotomy or TAVI or aortic valve replacement. What is appropriate for the patient? With patient symptomatic severe MS, considering about balloon mitral valvotomy or MVR. If the patient has got severe degree of mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation with dilated LV, declining LVF, considering first MVR or AVR and then go to surgery. Posteric heart valve, heart valve. If the patient has got a posteric heart valve and is undergoing non cardiac surgery, there is no additional risk, provided there is no evidence of valve or ventricular dysfunction. And the major problem is the need for a modification of the anticoagulation regimen and prophylaxis for endocarditis. This should be kept in mind. Cardiomyopathies are different types hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, obstructive, non obstructive, restrictive cardiomyopathy, myopathy, and dilated cardiomyopathy. You have to uh, understand the basic pathophysiology of the of these disease processes, then you can address the problem. How you can take the situation? Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy patient uh, should you should have to over uh, you should avoid the overdiagnosis. You should uh, avoid hypovolemia that can increase the gradient of the uh, LVOT. You have to avoid peripheral vasodilatation that also may increase the gradient and use of inotrope may induce arrhythmia. Dilated cardiomyopathy is a very important one, uh, particularly those patients who are pregnant having a history of peripartum cardiomyopathy. In this case, you have to optimize the fluid administration, avoid myocardial depression drugs, and try to reduce the heart rate. If the patient has decompensated heart failure, it's gone to surgery, better, if delay the surgery, if Prescribe the patient with modern anti failure drugs. Try to take time for stabilization of the patient because a patient having a stabilized heart failure versus a patient without heart failure, perioperative mortality rate almost same. Although long term mortality is more in patients with heart failure. A stable patient plus one or two may undergo surgery, preferably at centers with experience in managing high risk patients. These are the recommendations made by. European Society of Cardiology. And cardiac arrhythmias, you know the name of the symptomatic or hemodynamically significant arrhythmias, non-significant arrhythmias. The significant arrhythmias should be treated before the patient undergoing a non-cardiac operation. Particularly, the more common is atrial fibrillation. We have to take care about the red and non-sustained sustained monomorphic VT and polymorphic VT open indicate underlying structural heart disease, needs evaluation, treatment, either medical or interventional, and the patient should go only undergo surgery after that. VPCs or ventricular premature beats and non-sustained VT, no worse outcome and do not require any therapy, particularly if the patient has got no structure or disease. Asymptomatic conduction system disease, you have to face it frequently. The patient has got left anterior hand block, patient has got uh, bifascicular block, bundle branch block, left bundle branch block, or even trifascicular block. One thing is very important, it does not predict any high grade AV block and does not require each cell TPM prophylaxis implantation. So you have to keep in mind this situation because it don't uh, make the patient unnecessarily, to don't make delay for the surgical procedure only with this problem. The patient with congenital heart disease, if the heart disease is acyanotic, and the left to right shunt, and the shunt is not so much uh, large, and the patient has got uh, oil compensated cardiovascular status, no heart failure, no arrhythmia, risk is low. But the patient population that appear to be particularly at high risk is congenital cyanotic heart disease, patient having moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension, ultimately leading to Asian Menger syndrome, evidence of clinical active heart failure, and significant dysarrhythmia, particularly the atrial dysarrhythmias. So these sorts of people are more at risk of development of the operative cardiovascular systems. Pulmonary hypertension, this is often a neglected parameter, but it produces sometimes uh, 
many crises in the perioperative period should be avoided unless absolutely necessary. It increases the postoperative complications significantly as high as 42%, leading to acute right heart failure, pulmonary hypertensive crisis, and increased mortality. One thing is important, degree of pulmonary hypertension, degree of RV dysfunction, and NYHA status will dictate the patient perioperative outcome. Optimization of the treatment regime with the drugs are available for permanent vasodilator therapies before surgery should be instituted and surgery should be done in a center where there is expertise, there is, there is expert, uh, pulmonary hypertension expertise there. This is a very important part uh, of cardiovascular uh, patient management during the surgical period because uh, many of the patients are having due to increased longevity, increased uh, sophisticated treatment from uh, cardiovascular diseases, the patients are surviving more. So patients may need pacemakers, IDC, ICDs, CRDs, and these we collectively call this cardiovascular implantable uh, electronic devices. So it encompass not only CIED programming, but also we have to give attention to the underlying cardiovascular disorders that uh, for which the implant has been given. That condition we have to address also as well. What is the main issue? Main issue is the electromagnetic interference. How it happens? Pacemaker function may be oversensed, may be patient inhibited. Pacemaker function may be inhibited. Uh, what happens in case of ICDs? The anti tachycardia function of the ICD may be either inhibited or there may be false detection of the tachyarrhythmia ultimately leading to inappropriate shocks or device may be reset. It's very in intricate. But what we can do to avoid all this problem? One, we can do in surgical. We can eat the bipolar electrocautery. We can keep the electrocautery device away from the device. We can minimize the length of the burst of the Electrocautery less than five seconds and using the lowest possible amplitude. What we can do as a cardiologist, we can do what we can recommend. We can recommend it depends on many factors, either patient is dependent or not or on the permanent pacemaker or not, either the surgical procedure are being done, from medical part or inform medical part. I'm not going to in details about that, but we can recommend and to apply a magnet over the skin of the CIEDs. What it can do, it can make the permanent pacemaker into an asynchronous mode, turn into an asynchronous mode, it will not be sensed anyhow. So it will protect from inappropriate oversensing. An ICD, what will do, uh, what will do the magnet? Magnet will suspend the tachyarrhythmia detection and inhibition of tachy therapy will also be inhibited. This is dangerous one if the patient has got frequent ICD shock. So in for those patients, patients should have continuous cardiac monitoring during perioperative period, and the external defibrillator should be available. And those patients who has permanent pacemaker dependent, there should have some, uh, there should have some arrangement for doing temporary pacemaker, either transcutaneous or transvenous. And you have to reprogram device pre and post op. And this is all disease-wise or disease-specific management. Now, uh, is there any role of certain drugs to minimize the adverse perioperative cardiovascular outcome? Is there other drugs which can uh, dose and the uh, dose modification may need, or even withdrawal of the drugs may need to have before going to surgical procedure? We'll go in details about beta blocker, statin, antiplatelet, anticoagulant, calcium channel blocker, and drugs for prophylaxis when they infect the endocarditis. We shall go on vital drugs, not all the drugs. Perioperative beta blocker therapy. One thing important that the perioperative use of beta blocker was associated with the reduction in the perioperative myocardial ischemia, non-fatal MI, non-fatal cardiac arrest, no doubt in it. But at the same time, there is clear association exists between the beta blocker administration and more incidence of the mortality bradycardia, hypotension, stroke. So these two things should be important one, to keep the patient safe before giving the uh, beta blockers. You see all the studies, multi-randomized control trials, I'm go not going in details about that, beginning from bubble study, MAPS, DIPOM, DBSA, POIS, 
the boys and decreased style, which is not mentioned here because of a lot of controversy about the uh, decreased style. These two trials basically form the basis of beta blocker therapy. So what are the recommendations? Continue the beta blocker, whatever the reasons patient is getting, continue it in perioperative period. Don't withdraw the beta blocker because it will be harmful for the patient. And addition can be considered but the patient, if the patient is undergoing high risk surgery, or the patient has got more than two RCRI risk factors, or if the patient has got heart failure, you have to introduce the beta blocker. Don't necessarily need to start it preoperatively on. So what is the drug of the choice? Different studies are there, but etinolol and the bisoprol, these two drugs are preferred. Those, it should be iterated starting with the low dose. Bisoprolol start with 2.5 milligram and antinolol start from 50 milligram. Target heart rate should be 60 to 70, milli, 70 beats per minute. Blood pressure should be kept systolic more than 100 millimeter of mercury. Duration is very important, not at the day of the surgery. Preferably at least seven days. If you can, if you have time, you can add the drugs even 30 days before the surgical procedure. And at the same time, you have to continue up to 30 days after the surgical procedure. You see the recommendation. I am not going into recommended. Hard calcium channel blocker is an always and is alternative for beta blocker. Where the beta blockers cannot be tolerated or contraindicated, then you can add the calcium channel blocker. But our studies showed reduction of the episode of myocardial ischemia or SVT, but no mortality benefit. Diltiazem is preferred than verapamil, nifedipine, rather contraindicated. Statins, it has been found in different observational studies that statin produces reduction in alcohol mortality. Drug of choice is statin with a long half life. It should be instituted two weeks before surgery and should continue one month after surgery at least. You see the recommendations SEAI and ARVs, there is no perioperative cardiovascular benefits, protection, or harm. There is a risk of hypotension during anesthesia, particularly if it is co administered with beta blockers. So better to discontinue there before the surgery. If necessary, and if, if you think it should continue, you can continue, but you have a close monitoring. You see the recommendation, I'm not going in details. Dual antiplatelet therapy, which is a core for the management of the cardiac patients having cardiac diseases, as well as having coronary stent implantation. So try to delay the elective surgical procedure until complete full course of the dual antiplatelet therapy. And what are those? Ideally, you have to wait at least six months, both for BMS of death. For balloon angioplasty, up to 14 days, you can, uh, up to 40 days GAPT. For BMS, 30 days for DASH, better to continue 12 months. But newer generation DASH sometimes need to have continue only six months or even less than that will be a 2 be indication for stopping the DAPT, why there is need to have surgical procedure in an emergency or urgent procedure. If the surgery cannot be delayed for a longer period, and the risk of delaying surgery is more than risk of strength of disease, can you imagine? If the patient is suffering from malignant disease and highly malignant disease, if the patient has got vascular anomaly involving the brain or eye, very important structures, then you have to perform the surgery first. So in those cases, you have to talk with the anesthetist, you have to talk with surgeon, try to continue DAPT if it is feasible, if the condition allows, because you have to calculate the has bleed scoring system. So if it allows, then continue DAPT. If the condition does not allow to continue DAPT, then continue aspirin in a perioperative period, stop the uh, antiplet other antiplatelets, pasuprel, ticaglular, or copidoglular, five to seven days prior to surgical procedure, and again resume this antiplatelet drug within 24 to 72 hours with a loading dose. With a loading dose, and uh, this thing has been already discussed. The patient with coronary stent, um, and how we can go for the surgical procedure. If the risk of strain thrombosis is very high with severe consequences, like if the patient has got left main stenting, proximal, osteal LED stenting, then patient, if there is strain thrombosis, it will increase the perioperative mortality, not only morbidity, mortality. So in those cases, you may think of bridging therapy. Although the question, there is question about the bridging therapy, whether 
it is able to reduce the strength thrombosis or not. But theoretically, there is possibility. And more often, we choose spine growth because it is P2Y12 inhibitor. Onset of action is immediate and half-life is short and offset of the action is only one hour rather than GP2V3 inhibitors. And anticoagulation management, again, you have to calculate the thrombotic risk versus hemorrhagic risk. Surgery with low risk for serious bleeding, no need to hold anticoagulants, continue anticoagulants at the minimum possible dose, at the same time do the surgery. But if the surgery carries high risk for bleeding, need to hold anticoagulant. Now, how to hold your anticoagulants? It depends which drug you are giving to the patient. Is it working? So stop the drug three to five days before the surgery and see the NR. If it is less than 1.5, proceed for surgery. Babigatran, Rivaroxaban, Apoxaban, Edoxaban, these are Noak or Duak. This should be hold at least two days before the surgery. These drugs has got a defined onset and offset of action. So very easy to manipulate this drug in perisurgical period. But one thing is important, resume the drug within 48 to 72 hours if the bleeding risk is high and within after 24 hours if the bleeding risk is low. But again, if you think the risk of thrombosis is high, patient may need breathing help. Why to breathe this patient? If the patient has got atrial fibrillation with charge pass score more than four, you know the about the charge pass score. If the patient has got mechanical prosthetic valve, particularly in both mitral and aortic position. If the patient has mitral valvular repair with the past three months, if the patient has got history of wrist and thromboembolism. So what are the agents that are preferred for breathing? Low molecular weight heparin, definitely, and unfortunate heparin. Old low molecular weight heparin at least 12 hours prior to the surgical procedure, and heparin, four hours pre-procedure. Now, next you come to choice of the anesthetic agent. The choice of the anesthetic agent has been considered to have little importance in terms of the patient outcome, provided that vital functions are adequately supported. But decisions should be made after joint discussion with surgeon, anesthetist, and the patient, which is often neglected on our part. This should not be, because if you don't discuss with the patient during the operation, during the in the operation in the operating theater, you will see the chaos is there. What is the chaos? The surgeon will say, this is my patient, give anesthesia of my choice. The anesthetist will angry reply, I will give anesthesia of my choice because I am the anesthetist. But at the same time, the patient is taking the chance. The patient is telling whether to pay hospital bill or not. This is my choice. So you may lose many, you may lose many things. So before going into the anesthesia, you have to discuss with the anesthetist, discuss with the surgeon, discuss with the even family physician and the patient relatives. But this is a primary job of the surgeon. Definitely depends on the several factors, type of the surgery, cardiac status, patient comorbidities, and the patient preferences. Because the patient preferences makes a lot of difference. In 1996, when the patient is going to operate it, going to be operated, he told the doctor that Doctor, please give me the general anesthesia, not regional. I don't want to be AOI. But now in 2016 and onward, he is going to tell you that, Doctor, give me the only regional anesthesia. I want many selfies interoperatively, want to shout Facebook, WhatsApp, and play game during the surgical procedure. So you need to discuss with the patient about the choice of anesthesia. But Although there are four main classification of the anesthesia, but concern is that anesthesia management skills more important than the technique. And the safest technique is the one the practitioner does the best. Anesthetic technique must be based on the desired hemodynamic goals during anesthesia, which have to be told by a cardiologist. And this is the role of the cardiologist that you have to tell the surgeon and anesthesiologist what you want good for the patient and what are the parameters you want to make suitable for the patient during anesthesia. Do you need volume volume? Do you need volume depletion? Do you need vasodilatation? Do you need uh, after load reduction? You will tell to the patient. Do you need inotropes? So you will guide the patient about the hemodynamic goals. So at the last, my conclusion, conclusive slide is telling that the perioperative team approach and shared decision on the part of the surgeon, cardiologist, anesthesiologist, and the patient 
is very needed. Clinical risk, surgical risk, and functional capacity plays the vital role to determine the perisurgical or perioperative outcome. In general, conservative approach is recommended. And last line is very important to memorize always. Testing or revascularization is not indicated just to get the patient through the operation. And lastly, thank you all. Thank you for patient sharing. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Khalik Bhai. Excellent elaborate presentation. Uh, sometimes I we lucky, COVID, COVID give a chance to hear a nice lecture from a learned uh, speaker. So elaborate and descriptive uh, lecture. Really, we honored and delighted IPDI. Thank, thank you, Khalik Bhai. Thank you. 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 You know, after going through the whole lecture and all those informations, all those guideline directed informations, I feel busy. Yes. What am I going okay. to do in treating a particular patient? And you cannot only be directed by the guidelines. You have to take under consideration what your resources are what the patient can actually afford and while you are treating the patient. It, 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 this is very important because in a, uh, a patient who has trivascular block has one history of syncope. That patient, a patient with trivascular block, no history of syncope, totally asymptomatic, the approach should be totally different. The first patient who had did you get me? Uh, I think sir, most on the sir, top I'll right. Yeah. Yeah. The first patient would need the operation done in a hospital where if the patient develops complete heart flow, he can be immediately uh, be put on a temporary pacemaker. The second patient would not need that. So the choice of uh, surgery, the choice of hospital also changes with the scenario. That you have to remember. And the surgeon for the patient he is also give you input how much time it will be needed, how long the patient would be under sedation, under anesthesia, uh, what type of anesthesia he is going to do, and who is the anesthetist. It, it, it really, because uh, it, from person to person, Omita Bachchan and uh, Onurag Bachchan is not the same. We have to remember that. The, both may be actors, but Omita Bachchan is Omita Bachchan. So who are the actors acting in the operation theater that also determine the outcome? All these factors have to, take, have to be taken into account. And I always tell my students, please, whenever you are dealing with a cardiac patient who need to undergo surgery, anesthesia, you have to tell them what are the probable problems, how much we can uh, reduce the problem, how much we cannot do. And you should have a clear uh, conversation with the family of the patient. That will uh, avoid many of the, um, I should say, unpleasant situations. Many of the faculties are here. I think they are very much willing to put comments. I would invite them. Uh, the, the faculty uh, asked from the attendees, Dr. Shweb Ahmed from Silet. Please ask your question, Dr. Shweb Ahmed. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, sir, Abhi sir, and IPDI. And special thanks to Khalifa Juman sir for your brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, sir, actually, uh, we cardiologists who are working in a multidisciplinary hospital, in our day to day practice, uh, we, uh, every time we face uh, this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, um, problem, 
to comment about the uh, non non cardiac surgery uh, risk. Sir, my question is uh, uh, two question. First question is what, what are the medical legal importance of uh, of uh, the cardiologist uh, when we recommend is there any fault with the medical important and when we uh, we, uh, when we uh, got a call, uh, when we get a call from any uh, uh, non cardiac surgery, uh, as a cardiologist, what uh, in our recommendation or in our comments, which point we should uh, must we should write down? Sometimes, because sometimes in our busy, uh, busy schedule, we are very reluctant. So we just feel like it's, uh, it's moderate risk or high risk or something. Uh, we don't want to point out the risk of complication or something else. Uh, is there any uh, problem arises in medical legal uh, perspective? What should uh, is, what is the uh, best way to write down how to write comments uh, in a call for uh, for any uh, non medical Talik bhai, Talik bhai. Uh, any referral referral. So I want to yeah, refer, yeah. we should the consultant will write down the properly. Uh, so, sir, we, which the points should be this? Sir, I have another, another I question. Like first, this uh, question. First, thank first you question. question. Thank you, Dr. Shoy, for your nice question. Uh, basically, there is no shortcut way to recommend anything because you have to go through the patient clinical, you have a clinical diagnosis, patient. Uh, you are asked for see the patient. Suppose he is suffering from mitral valvular disease, but when you examine the patient, he thinks that the patient has got multi-valvular disease. And uh, the follow-up of the patient, you see the patient has got high potential, but on the follow-up, you see the patient has got high potency. And the drugs which are going on is not of properly doses or proper drugs are not here. So you need to have a comprehensive cardiovascular assessment and then you come to a diagnosis and then assess the functional status of the patient clinically by assessing the uh, activities of the daily living and recommend after that because the majority of the cases mild to moderate disease likely uh, valvular heart disease can tolerate the surgery so you find define the your clinical diagnosis and determine the risks the points you have to remember, one thing is the diagnosis. You have to give a clinical diagnosis to your that this patient has got such kind of disease, number one. Number two, if the surgery is deemed to be emergency or urgency or elective, then if it emergent or urgent, then he has to go through the operation very soon. So you will calculate the risks and tell the patient has got these and this can happen even around the perioperative period, and then to minimize the perioperative complication, you suggest your medications. And at the same time, you have to talk with the patient and the patient attendants about the leaks of the procedure. So always try to assist the patient further, not depending on the papers that have been given to you as a referral. Go through the already done papers for the patient, and if you need, you do certain investigation, to come to a clinical diagnosis and then can assess the patient and give the your conclusive remarks what to do and what are the options and what are the drugs you can reduce or minimize the perioperative complication and what can happen in perioperative period and how they can be dealt uh, very efficiently with how measures these four or five points you can have can I add something? Can I add something? Yes, sir. Depending, sir. Uh, I'll give you an example. A patient who had an old, old antiseptal MI and has underwent PCI two or three years ago, now need to undergo cholecystectomy. So they have referred it to you. I would write it like this. this uh, the patient has OMI antiseptal three years back. Uh, single vessel disease, uh, PCI done to LAD, three years back. LB function, LBEF now, this. Uh, blood pressure, uh, well controlled. Diabetic, blood sugar, poorly controlled. 
Jyoti ta nephro, if he the patient has nephropathy, I would mention the patient has nephropathy with creatine level this. I am putting out the risk factors from my viewpoints. And then I would say antiplatelet has to be stopped five days before the surgery. Three years ago, he has underwent uh, PCI. The patient LBF is quite normal. So I can easily stop the antiplatelet now. Restart antiplatelet as early as possible post surgery. They can start it on the second day. Second day or second post operative day, they can start it. Avoid fluid overload. Let's say the patient ejection fraction is 45% or 40%. I would put it in right down, avoid fluid overload. So that because the patient is not able to take uh, food for six hours or 12 hours or 24 hours at most. The laparoscopic system, they uh, withheld the food only for 12 hours or 24 hours. If they put too much fluid at that time, that LB dysfunction can get worse. So just write it down, avoid fluid overload. That is helpful. Now, if a patient with, uh, has a history of this patient, has a history of synco, though ejection fraction is quite all right, I would be cautious. I would be suggesting, I would be suggesting that the uh, patient had history of synco. I put it down in writing. Please uh, monitor the uh, uh, patient paraoperatively and keep a major at hand or defib at hand. When it, you have to anticipate what can go wrong and guide the anesthetist, guide the surgeon accordingly. That really helps. That's a team approach. Please do not try it. It is moderate, it is a mild. What does that mean? What does it mean? A mild patient, once in a blue moon, a patient can get very bad. And for that patient, that's 100%. So this 5% is 10% is, that's for your assessment, how much emphasis you have to give for preparing the, preparing the patient. For a bad patient, I would suggest, please adjust the dose certainly, repeat this day three days after, and then do the surgery. And for elective surgery, if the patient has poor LB function, if the policy treatment is not urgent, I would suggest, please, assess the patient properly, do the revascularization, and then uh, do the elective surgery. You have to write it honestly. Uh, that's the survey we should do to the patient. Professor Nuzusar is here. I think he can put in something. Sir. I, uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, well, the question should be asked to the student. And again, in this point, actually, uh, I would like to uh, make a few comments only. The important first comment is a general comment. Sometimes the physician, uh, surgeons or the dentist or gynecologist send a letter that take a permission from the cardiologist. Please try to avoid this word. There is no permission from a, a cardiologist or a nephrologist to give the patient that you go on under surgery. Actually, they have to give a, <clears throat> a, a comprehensive assessment and risk classification, as, as Dr. Professor uh, Odudu uh, was telling, uh, about his medication, what to do, what not to do. So this is the suggestion number one. As uh, Dr. Shoeb was uh, asking, this is a very common question that uh, many times they ask, ask, send the patient to the cardiologist and ask them for their decision. But what I, I face, most of them ask, the, the patient asked me, that sir, apna suggestion chese, apna permission chese, da tulviki na. So that is not the right way. You say the decision, the, what about the risky or not, uh, that is very important. So that is the one point. Another point is, uh, the, you should assess the patient from your perspective, surgical perspective and other perspective. Third important point is, you know that uh, in our country, the anesthesiology department, anesthesiology subject as a whole and, and critical care medicine has developed much. And anesthesiologists, they have got their separate risk stratification from ASHA 1 to ASHA 6. So try to also understand what their classification is and try to consult with them if the patient is emergent or urgent. So many patients are either their decision in the hospital setting, like emergent and urgent patient, those are in the hospital setting, and majority of the cold patients are, are uh, being uh, uh, sent for advice uh, is in the private chamber or in the outpatient basis as the professor was telling. So the main aspect 
actually detailed by uh, Professor Vadu, we have to maintain it and try, try to be this thing. And then, number four is try to see who is the surgeon, if possible, who is the uh, anesthetist, and what is the facilities over there. Every hospital, every OT has got no facilities. In other countries where the, where the health insurance is there, the hospital authority and the surgeon concern or the, uh, or the intervention concern must give his own statistics. So that is important. Uh, just as uh, give any uh, uh, small story, and I will stop it. Uh, somebody, some surgeon said that he uh, developed a procedure by which this disease can be cured. Ninety percent cases. So hearing this, one mother brought his child, uh, child there with the surgeon. Uh, Sir, uh, this is the case. You have uh, give the advertisement that you can do about ninety percent success. So then he assessed the patient. And the uh, surgeon says, look, uh, this operation actually has got 90% fatality, mortality, but I'm sure your uh, patient will be okay. Then the mother is be scared. Sir, why, sir? Look, I have done till now nine patients and all dead. So you're the, this is the chance. Your patient must survive. Otherwise, statistics will be wrong. So, okay. Though we should take statistics, then that statistics should also be by uh, it will be judged by your clinical experience, the uh, evidence-based guidelines, and and the and the location of where you are doing what the surgeon is doing. You have to consider everything, and overall you have to make the patient understand the real picture. If they understand real picture, possibly there will be uh, no other uh, other uh, other. Uh, abnormalities or other uh, yeah, bad incidents as are occurring in our country. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Shweb, the last question. Yes, sir. Last sir question. Another, another problem, if I uh, ask to attend any uh, operation theater as a cardiologist, which facility we are uh, asking for? And what, do, what uh, will be our uh, 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 activity in this uh, uh, theater, what it should look uh, like. To me, uh, this is my personal okay. answer. This, to me, this is my personal answer. This is ridiculous. Uh, actually, the operative theater and the uh, operation uh, in, in environment is, should be maintained by the anesthesiologist, uh, nurses, and everything there. If there is any specific, if there is any specific uh, suggestion is they want, then they can contact the cardiologist. So yes, you, are, you are a cardiologist, you have to go there and you stand over there. That is, I think this is ridiculous. Yes. Actually, I personal, feel, personal. This is my yeah. personal opinion. I personally always request. I always tell, choose a good anesthetist. I don't that have anything to do in there. I have no room. I can prepare the patient. I can manage the uh, post-operative complication. Or yeah. I can do a specific procedure. But that's it. I don't have any role. That's a domain of anesthetologist. Exactly. Exactly. Sometimes for VIP patient, we have to. No, 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 no,
just take a short history. We had episode of perpetration. I usually put a, a, a note in my referral uh, the answer that the patient may develop atrial arrhythmias. Please keep amitarone or ivitigoxin at hand. That's the note for the anesthetist. I, mean, I tell the patient's attendant, please show it to the surgeon or to the anesthetist. Just make them aware. Or okay. high participation gross LPA, please put the note. The, the patient should be put on good analgesia, good anxiolytic to avoid tachycardia. And if you put fluid in there, the patient is going to develop uh, fluid overload and pul acute pulmonary edema. That's the point. Shamal, your question? Small. Shamal. Dr. Shamal? Do you hear me? He's not now here, sir. Okay, Dr. Dr. Rahat. Dr. Rahat will come here. Dr. Rahat, unmute yourself. Dr. Rahat, uh, only one question for the one at this. Start on, sir. Yeah. Shamal, you connect? Yeah, Shamal yeah. came. Shamal, yes, please. Uh, you please yes, ask the question. Yeah. Shamal is muted. Yeah. Shamal, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, Shamal, yes. please yes, ask question. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Khalil yes. Jaman, sir, for nice, elaborate, and informative presentation, which is, which is our daily indicate. My question to Khalil Jaman, sir, is a 45 years old man present with acute anterior MI and treated with fibrinolysis. Two days after treatment, suddenly develop acute abdomen, which may be due to duodenal perforation or intestinal obstruction. What will be the treatment plan for this patient? Thank you. These are practical problems, basically, who are dealing with the cardiac diseases. Uh, they have to face this problem very frequently because uh, the perforation of a gas containing hollow viscous is an urgent procedure. And at the same time, patient has suck, patient is recovering from acute myocardial infarction and he has got already streptokinase with thrombolytic study. So decision is very difficult. Uh, in those cases, as the patient has got active cardiac condition and the surgeon used to uh, follow it up Make it on a conservative approach if the patient has got no features of shock, no features of septicemia, and no features of severe acute abdomen. And the, after the assessment, it's better to undergo a conservative approach for this abdominal diagnosis for perforation of the gas containing hollow viscous. At the same time, you have to continue with your anti therapy. If it shows that the patient's abdominal condition is gradually deteriorating, that is, that is, patient develops septicemia, severe abdominal pain, shock, and like that. So you need to have urgent surgical, uh, emergency surgical procedure, keeping vigorous, intraoperative, invasive hemodynamic monitoring, and as well as vigorous perioperative services. At the same time, you have to do the surgery, because surgery is needed to surgery. So Can I add something? Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, in these cases, one of the most important thing is to uh, please converse with the family. The patient had a life-changing situation regarding the MI. Another is the acute abdomen. And that is complicated by the presence of MI, presence of the uh, drug that has been used, the blood thinners. Now, any surgical procedure within one month of MI carries high mortality risk. You have to tell the patient that. And as Khalaki Jamana has said, if possible, surgeon will go for conservative treatment. But if then the patient really needs intervention, again, you have to tell the patient. What I tell my uh, patient's family, look, you are in a double geoparty. If you do not operate, the patient is going to die. But he is also likely to die during surgery. The chances are, we cannot say how much, but these are the chances he can have a major problem. And if I do not do this, he's going to get worse and this and this. And after, when the condition gets much worse, the intervention procedure gets much 
riskier. And you have to give permission knowing the risk. Without your permission, without your explicit written permission, we really cannot proceed. We can do only the conservative part, but we cannot really proceed. Make it a decision where the participation is from the patients, the doctor, surgeon, the cardiologist, and the anesthetist. That makes things clearer and helpful. Okay, Dr. Atul Kadir. Dr. Martin, sir. Sir, my question is, is there any precaution regarding antiarrhythmic drug? A patient previously continued antiarrhythmic drug. Do we need any kind of precaution? Thank you for the question. Uh, I have not done the antiarrhythmic drugs in perioperative pharmacotherapy because the, if the antiarrhythmic drugs are necessary, you have to continue the antiarrhythmic drugs in the perioperative period. Even you may need to add some antiarrhythmic drugs to minimize the risk. What are the common arrhythmias in our country? We have to face day to day life more commonly. These are atrial fibrillation. We used to manage this with beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, even with digoxin, or in certain cases, amiodarone. So, if these drugs, with these drugs, patients is stable, patient's hemodynamic status is good, with adequate control of the rate. With continuation of these drugs, you can go ahead with the surgical procedure. Special attention to thromboembolic fluids. Second, if the patient is getting some drugs, likely what are the antiarrhythmic drugs we used to have? Beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, again amiodarone, and digoxin. So, if the patient having ventricular arrhythmias and getting amiodarone for uh, prevention of repeated episode of ventricular tachycardia, you can even continue with a Injectable amiodarone at hand. If the patient has got ventricular tachycardia even paraoperative period, you can bolus. You can administer the bolus dose of the amiodarone at that time. You have got a defibrillator at the same time at your hand to treat. So, if the patient has got with antiarrhythmic drugs, if the patient condition is stable, you can continue the antiarrhythmic drug, reinstitute the drug immediately after the post period. If needed, you can. Convert the oral antiarrhythmic drugs into intravenous drugs, either intravenous beta blocker or intravenous. So, or treatment, if it is needed, you have to continue. You may have to convert oral agents into intravenous drugs. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tan Singh Young? Dr. Tan? Dr. Tan? Uh, yes, good evening. Thank you, uh, Prof, for such a nice and uh, informative uh, presentation. Actually, I have a question is, uh, uh, from the point of view of cardiologists, right, what will be the preoperative fluid therapy for major surgery? Usually, this question will ask to the anesthesiologist, but from point of view uh, from cardiologists, uh, what will be the preoperative fluid therapy for the major surgery? Fluid therapy, before surgery. Fluid therapy. Uh, very terribly, thank you for your question because it is a very vital question. If we uh, try to overload the patient with fluid who has got uh, LV, uh, poor LV function, develop acute pulmonary edema during perioperative period, or if we make the patient fluid depleted, those patients who, who are suffering from obstructive lesion, particularly their ventricular outflow tract obstruction or inflow obstruction, like MS or aortic stenosis, this patient will have. Hypotension, tachycardia, that will lead to disastrous complication in the form of uh, ischemia, ventricular arrhythmias, and so on. So, fluid management is a vital role. Better is better to have a guide in those patients uh, who have fluid therapy. Like, if the patient has got a central venous line, see the right heart pressure, right arterial pressure, right side pressure, and administer the fluid. But particular attention should be paid on the patient having heart failure, either incipient heart failure or overt heart failure. So resting the fluid, number one. Number two, if the patient has the obstructive lesion, don't overload the patient with fluid. Try to try to give as minimum possible as fluid. And lastly, if the patient has got volume overload type of disease like aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation. The more is good LV function or, or satisfactory LV function, 
then patient you have to give the fluid to maintain the preload because the patient suffering for AR or MR, their cardiac output is dependent on the preload. So you have to maintain the preload. The type of fluid uh, is very much difficult on my part at the moment to tell about what type of fluid patient need in the preload, whether isotretic saline or dextrose or Hudson solution. If anybody in the panel uh, can tell about that, I will be very much. Nice. Dr. Mishka Ahmed, sir. Dr. Mishka Ahmed. Mishka, sir. Most important fluid is fluid therapy because heart failure, valvular disease, obstipulation, so congenital heart disease. So please, comments. Yes. Thank you, Mishka. I will give some comment, okay? Yeah, so sir. Okay. After Mishka. After yes, sir. After you, Mishka. You, give, you give first, sir. Then, then probably. Please, please. Sir, please sir, first. Mishka. No, sir, first. No, 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 no. Please. Yeah, that's <laughs> I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. Sir, as regarding the fluid management in patients with cardiac disease undergoing surgery, if the patient is already fluid logged, the condition of valvular or congenital heart disease that has led a situation where the patient has some form of congestion, that is the features of fluid overload, then we really have to prepare the patient before we go to the surgery and we adequately should adjust our diuretics so that the patient do not have the failure. And if the cause for this fluid overload is heart failure, then we also have to address the issue of heart failure. And many a cases, digoxin has got some role before they go for surgery. This is, this is one, of the, one, one of the place where we forget about digoxin because any patient who has got a fluid overload in their body due to heart failure, and if you really want to stabilize them and to want to send them to the OT, then digoxin is a very good drug to do that job. Uh, not only digoxin uh, stabilize the contractile function of the heart for the time being, it also reduces the heart rate, which is such an essence of a patient undergoing anesthesia. The, the best thing that you can do for a patient, cardiac patient who undergoes surgery is to is to reduce his heart rate because anesthesia itself poses some condition which causes tachycardia there are some some uh, some mouth dry, mouth drying agent like atropin sometimes often used which causes tachycardia and the main goal of, of a cardiologist is, is to prevent that that uh, uh, that tachycardia and uh, and and of same thought, I, I, I completely agree, agree with Professor Nozul sir that a cardiologist has got no role in the in, in the in the cardiac or in the operation theater because he cannot dictate the anesthetics that you should underload or overload the patient. You should not agent use an agent that causes tachycardia and other things. And as Wadud, Professor Wadu said, the best thing is to you choose the best anesthetics. And what I do, I tell them to have the have the operation done uh, early in the morning and preferably in the first day of the week, and uh, then probably we can prepare some of our, our bed, and then then I advise them to choose the to the appropriate best position for that. As we got fluid management during the anesthesia, uh, the the anesthetic uh, in in the Western world and and even in BASMMU we have the transesophageal echocardiography, which is, which is an excellent tool, which can estimate the proper left ventricular volume load, even right moment to moment during the operation, during the surgery. And when there are, there are critical patients undergoing surgery and in whom the fluid loading condition is a concern, they use the transesophageal echo. Immediately they find when the heart is contracting, they know that this patient is requiring fluid very rapidly. And when the, when this, when they see some feature of hypercontractile and other other things, then they take the measure accordingly. So the fluid overload management, it, it begins with cardiologists. Uh, uh, if the patient has cardiac problem and the fluid is logging, and again during the during the operation, anesthetic has got some role. And as regarding the patient who has who is not otherwise overloaded, but in whom there we have to design some form of uh, fluid. Probably Hartman solution is, is the best solution. And we always can track it out it, uh, the balance between input and, and output, the, the fluid that he used to take 
orally before the surgery, and all these things will come into into concern. Uh, sir, I, I work in a in a hospital which is multidisciplinary hospital. For last 20 years, we are actually facing so many cases of patient surgical patient uh, with cardiac disease undergoing. So I, I have some comment here if, if I'm allowed to say thereafter after after you finish your agendas. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, now, now uh, motion you understand why I, I gave uh, Meshka fast because much of what I will be telling has already been told by him. <laughs> so that is one of the reasons. Uh, actually, Professor Meshka worked with me a very long time, maybe more than 20 or 30 years actually. And he has a greatest experience uh, doing high risk surgery with cardiovascular diseases, combining with the gynae fellows with the surgical fellows, neurosurgical fellows, and I think he has got tremendous experience uh, on the pre, post, and uh, post-operative uh, peri, peri and post-operative management in cardiac patient who is uh, who was undergoing in different type of surgery. Uh, but only one thing I want to add is fluid management, pre-operative, perioperative, and post-operative, very important in those patients who has got cardiac dysfunction, which may not be that he has got a heart failure. Say, for example, in, even in COPD patient, if he undergoes surgery, this is also in a, in, in a dysfunction, right? right, right ventricular dysfunction there. In right ventricular dysfunction, fluid management, again, very, very important. So this has been discussed all the way from the Then we have, to, and we have to understand, we have to assess about the patient uh, preoperatively, whether the patient has got frank failure or the patient in the pre-failure stage or in the patient has got sub uh, tabulation. I think you correct, uh, uh, if I am I'm, I'm doing wrong. So sometimes you think that this patient have got certain subtle means minimal or subclinical left ventricular function. Possibly nowadays is very commonly used. You can do a GLS and a good echocardiography so that you can find it out. So this is number one. Number two is regarding failure in preoperative. The important tool, uh, apart from transfusion because that may not be available everywhere. If you are having undergo abdominal surgery or chest sparing surgery, then even you can do with the trans uh, transthoracic probe. Uh, number one. Number two. Nowadays, even the anesthesiologists are using the lung and the uh, lung ultrasound of fluid management. This is very simple to understand, and uh, the, you can just you can uh, monitor it very quickly. So it is very important to to learn by the uh, anesthesiologist lung imaging and Transthoracic even, transthoracic even. In many countries nowadays, power operative transthoracic echocardiography is done by the anesthesiologist. Excellent. So things are now coming. So uh, regarding answering to that that question, the fluid management. So you have to manage the fluid perioperatively, and and you have to suspect that which patient may develop uh, fluid uh, abnormalities and how that can be managed, right? Especially in elderly patient with COPD or uh, some sort of lung disease, this is very important for fluid management. Sometimes we think that the patient has got heart failure, so giving, giving diabetics, the patient may worsen. So that is very important. So this must be said. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, sir, I, I forgot one important point, sir. Sorry. Uh, the use of ultrasound and the hepatic vein is so important in deciding yes. the fluid management. Yes. And it's so These important. Two important. It is, we know if, if there is IVC collapse that the patient is needing some fluid. Yes. And the IV, if the IVC, as, as a matter of fact, I went to Square Hospital and in some hospital where to train our our anesthetic colleagues and the intensivists to have some knowledge on this uh, study of uh, hepatic vein and the inferior vein so that the patient gets some benefit from that. Thank you, sir. And these two thing is very important. And any graduate, medical graduate, can learn it by three, four days. Is it yes, Mishka? Yes, sir. Right, sir. Yeah, they, they call it uh, fast. Uh, yeah. I, I, I want to comment on the health motion, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, do, you, do you think, sir, in Bangladesh, you are little about worried about the central venous line or central venous CV pressure or Swan Kunz catheter is not used in Bangladesh, not so much. Our neighboring area, also India and uh, other area, I saw everybody know the uh, Swan Kunz catheter and CV line. Do you comment on the health motion, sir? Okay, thank you, Mosin. Actually, uh, this uh, problem has two aspects of management. One is the ideal management, another is the practical management. 
ideal management of the of high opt for the hemodynamic management hemodynamic monitoring like cb line uh, non invasive blood pressure monitoring intra arterial line schwangen catheter but these are not always practically feasible you know when there is a non cardiac surgery going in a private hospital there are four interested parties one is surgeon or gynecologist another is anesthetist third party is the patient fourth party is the hospital management and sometimes party enters into the scene there are the cardiologist all their interest in cardiologist want to get the operation through even if the cardiac morbidity and mortality if there is and the anesthetic to postpone the surgery with the sightest possible and the cardiologist has got a mediator role in the most of the cases and uh, and sometimes they have to pacify all the parties opinion in many of the cases they were already the patient is admitted in many of the cases and all the pre operative investigation and in that case if the cardiologist if if, if he or she takes a side this is a real, real real problem suppose a patient with cabg with lb dysfunction and a gall bladder disease you cannot do much for him from a cardiac point of view but if his gall bladder is not removed he might have some attacks of cholecystitis which might be confused as an acute coronary syndrome in those cases i think the practical solution is yes the patient should go for a surgery with a high risk consent you cannot uh, improve his cardiac condition any any more with with any any sort of treatment all treatment of options are in those cases you can give some relief by a procedure which can give a remedy to his problem and another thing that uh, we should be very careful when with the operations are done on prone position like the pcnl operation the spine surgery these operations are very high risk because the, if the patient is put on his chest uh, this uh, procedure should should be uh, uh, addressed with much caution and this should must undergo some hemodynamic monitoring even if they don't have a serious cardiac problem so if uh, we should try to Uh, adopt the ideal approach, but in some cases we have to deviate from the ideal approach and give a practical solution to the problem. We yes. should be following the government's rules, sir. Yeah, but the most of the our state, fellows state are not. Are, yeah, yeah. Our fellows yes. are not trained about yeah. this. Yeah, in, in in the private hospital, this is very difficult to give a ideal solution to this problem. You have to give a practical. My my yeah. approach is so you have to make a balance between the practical. and the ideal solution in yes. these cases thank you sir can i, can I add something uh, yes sir for this this meshkat bhai is always uh, teaching us about the value of the uh, uh, ivc look at the ivc if it is uh, uh, collapsed the patient needs to be if it is over dilated the hepatic veins are dilated you are over hydrated the target uh, the pressure central venous pressure is between uh, 8 to 12 not more than that if it is dilated it's already more than 18 the patient is going to have if you give more fluid pulmonary edema and uh, another thing is that a uh, prone position khalid bhai has rightly pointed out prone position operation is very risky there is hypotension the anesthetist has to keep a lot of fluid to cover to maintain the uh, pressure and that when the patient uh, uh, post operatively there is a fluid overflow you have to induce a diuresis or something to uh, get of the patient uh, of the uh, uh, intubation again for example spinal anesthesia the anesthetist has to give a lot of fluid in there in those cases epidural anesthesia is actually better for obstructive lesion for example in a ms patient under being uh, cesarean section the uh, scenario we get in our hospitals now that patient quite stable quite all right Then the cesarean section, then patient able to acute pulmonary edema. What has happened? Usually after the cesarean section, when the baby is taken out and there is a lot of blood going back into circulation from the placenta, and if the anesthetist started the fluid, external fluid, internal fluid, 
there's a huge overload of the patient. Yes. So if you put beforehand, if you instruct the uh, anesthetist, they please do not overload the patient. They become quite well. Among in our Dhaka Medical College experience, we have shown seen that uh, initially when I went there in 2009, there were a lot of patients with MS coming with these type of complications. But when we started teaching them, going in the gynecology department, giving them some lecture, what can we do? That problem has dramatically come down. So that should be always a team effort. Can I ask a question to uh, uh, Khalifu Jaman? Let's say a patient need uh, esophageal cancer, in a, it has to be resected, the stomach has to be pulled up, and then anastomosis is done. Now, that patient cannot take any food, any uh, orally, for at least seven to 10 days. And a severely hypertensive patient who has been well maintained on medication, how are you going to manage these patients? Uh, sir, this is very critical period uh, to manage the patient who is not taking antihypertensive drugs orally. But options are patient if the patient uh, can provide antihypertensive medication through IV route, like IV nitrate is available, IV nitroprusides, sometimes it is available, sometimes not. So intravenous drugs can be given. Number one, number two, uh, repeated administration of sublingual. Bisentine nitrate can alleviate the blood pressure to some extent, lower the blood pressure. I think the intravenous drug and the sublingual can I, drugs can help. Can I add something? The blood pressure. And sometimes chronicing, sometimes. Uh, temporary feeding gastrostomy can be. Can be. Even gastrostomy has to be, you have to start gastrostomy uh, okay. done after 48, preferably after 72 hours. Uh, uh, and sir is there. I was really hoping for he will be here. But not IV nitrate or IV nitroprusside. These are not available in the uh, uh, all over the country. But IV levetinol is widely available. Also, hydrolysin is available. These two we can use, and these are very helpful. Khalid sir, would, would you please comment? I was really Thank hoping you will be here. I, 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 yes, sir. I started uh, joined lately. Even then, this is a very interesting subject, and I am the person who regularly deals with all these <laughs> problems. So yes. My, uh, <laughs> yes. I, I want to share my experience actually. Yes. Uh, because last uh, about uh, more than 30 years, I am handling all these cases. Uh, and sometimes I take help from Wadud and other people available to me. Um, sir, my sir, one, sir, uh, sir, sir my, I, I will make a comment on. before you proceed. Uh, Professor yes. Etienne Khulilu Rahman is a magician. He is a cardiac yes. anesthetist. <laughs> and in the private hospital, he works all the Critical surgeries, the, our requirement is please, please, please make sure that Khalil sir is there. Now mm -hmm. the medician is talking. Now, sir, and is, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now, I, I want to uh, share my experience for our yes. colleagues for the cardiologist. What helps, I always expect from the cardiologist. Actually, rarely cancel any case for any cardiac problem. Because we have to the the, the uh, that, that is the risk and gain. So this is the number one. Because the patient who is dying, you cannot say he, he has got acute MI. You have to treat the acute MI and the uh, the, uh, the, the 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 pathology why he is dying. So these are the number one. The hospital you should choose the right place for treatment. This is the number one criteria. You cannot send a hospital like reason like this. So you have to choose which hospital is suitable for which patient. Uh, one thing I can share, uh, what happens, I am working in National Heart Foundation. For a long time, I cannot manage a good number of cases because there is no other multidisciplinary facility. If patient needs any acute abdomen case or perforation, or any other pathology, we have to refer the patient to other hospitals. This is one limitation of a single specialty. Sir, your network is not good. Cutting up. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> so 
and on ECG, he has got atrial fibrillation with a ventricular rate of 65 beat per minute. And on echocardiography, his RARV was dilated, moderate TR with PSP 60 millimeter of mercury. So when the uh, surgeon asked uh, me for perioperative cardiovascular evaluation, how should I write uh, it so that the anesthetist and surgeon gets a precise idea? Colleague, uh, that's short. Precisely, answer should be precise. Uh, short. Short. Yeah, short uh, yeah. uh, you have asked about man, uh, what this scenario tells that the patient has got atrial fibrillation, possibly of COPD origin. COPD with atrial fibrillation with pulmonary arterial systolic pressure, systole uh, 60 millimeter of mercury. So, patient has got COPD. Severe pulmonary hypertension with atrial fibrillation with control ventricular rate. So these and are the situations. Surgery. Now uh, surgery and the patient's age is 65 years. So another risk factor is there. So now we have to evaluate the patient. Did you do the, I mean, uh, what is the about the ejection fraction of the patient? Is the patient diabetic? Is the patient hypertension? LB function is good. To, LB function is good. So this patient, uh, Always is at risk considering his age, considering his pulmonary status, considering pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Because those patients who has got pulmonary arterial hypertension, they are more at risk of development of hypertensive crisis, right heart failure, and so on other complications. If the patient has got COPD, so likely concomitant coronary artery disease cannot be ruled out at the same time as a cause for arterial fibrillation. So evaluation is first before going into the surgical procedure. If the patient has got only COPD, atrial fibrillation, and pulmonary hypertension, then we have to first treat the COPD, reduce the bronchospastic component of the disease. That will reduce to, to some extent the pulmonary pressure. At the same time, with adequate control of the uh, COPD, the uh, arrhythmic, atrial arrhythmic problem may get reversion. But if not yet revert, we will treat the atrial fibrillation at the same time in the conventional manner. And third, for pulmonary hypertension of COPD origin, patient does not need any pulmonary vasodilator therapy, and it will be ineffective during the surgical period. We have to look after uh, about the patient low output syndrome and about the right-sided heart failure, whether it is happening or not. And fourth is that patient can be uh, operated with adequate control of heart rate, adequate control of uh, adequate treatment of the atrial fibrillation. So spinal anesthesia with adding, uh, proper management of the heart rate so that during the surgical procedure, heart rate cannot go above the 100 part in it. The fibrillatory rate does not right above the above that level. You have to take precaution, take all the drugs in hand, including IV beta blockers or uh, the patient COPD, so breathing reservation for beta blocker. IV digoxin is there, IV calcium channel blocker is there. You have to take all the precautions with you. And patient can go to surgical procedure. Regarding anticoagulation management, during surgical procedure, if the patient hemodynamically stable, there is no need to initiation of the anticoagulant therapy at the moment. And after the surgical procedure, anticoagulation can be given after the hemostasis is achieved. So I think this is the answer. If anybody can, or panelists can I add something? Add something. Okay. Sir, can I add something? Up. Yes. This patient has uh, pulmonary hypertension, as has been stated, probably due to COPD. He, has, he needs TURP, just not an emergency operation. I would rather go for very aggressive treatment of his uh, lung condition. And if his lung condition is improved, his pulmonary hypertension condition is also improved. Oxygen is shown, if you ensure that, you are also reducing the risk of uh, coexisting coronary disease induced problems, arrhythmias. And actual fibrillation as the rate is controlled, that may not be a problem. Other things as uh, Kalkujaman has said. But I think I would take some time, I would suggest the patient should have steroid inhaler with just physiotherapy, bronchodilators, assessment of other problems, stop the smoking, and uh, wait one or two months, then just go for surgery. Can, can I add something? Yes, yeah. Sir. Uh, one, one problem that dissed me down in this particular, this case, is pulmonary hypertension. Yes. We assume that this pulmonary pressure is due to the COPD, but it may not be the case. 
because because the patient is hypertensive and an elderly patient he also might have a diastolic heart failure a combination of diastolic heart failure and the atrial fibrillation makes the patient very vulnerable to whatever situation he goes for so assessment of the diastolic function and predicting whether the patient is going to have a heart failure during the operation will be a crucial point for this patient and and i disagree with professor wadud in a respective patient want to have some comfort and some better life then we should try to make it uh, done for him and we should do everything possible to make his surgery safe no i am not saying they stop the surgery i say defer it for two months make the patient less risky oh, then go for oh. surgery but the patient the patient but the patient thank you so much because who is the good choice so much because who is the good choice for the uh diastolic dysfunction and also uh, who is the good choice uh in first i have to really be sure whether the component of the diastolic failure is contributing to to the to this pulmonary hypertension and if if the uh, component of diastolic failure is being established we know there is no definite treatment for diastolic heart failure only thing that we can do is reduce the heart failure uh, sorry the reduce the heart rate since the patient is having atrial fibrillation heart rate will be very crucial and as you said anticoagulant will be a very important concern and at the same time maybe ticoxin will be a choice again for this patient yes yeah. symptom volume overload should be avoided yeah. can i can i share something yeah it, it, this these are the the tab surgery is is not easy is difficult one for the perioperative management because only this happen to aged patient the patient age is 65 and he have the copd definitely i i believe the copd can be controlled by inhaler or some physiotherapy until or unless it is controlled surgery cannot be done because cubit is very dangerous respiratory problem kills the patient earlier than any problem so we must prepare the patient for respiratory care next the arrhythmia the we should exclude other causes of arrhythmia for atrial fibrillation left right imbalance and any valvular causes so because the patient is 65 years old if it's okay then we are suggesting a spinal a spinal cause bradycardia and that is also sometimes arrhythmogenic and uh, sometimes it is moribund so uh, one should have the facility to increase or treat the arrhythmia instantly they must have anti arrhythmic drug and the facility for increasing the heart rate because most of the spinal cases it is the bradycardia that create the problem and for the anti coagulant anti plaque cannot be given because prostate is a such a surgeon the 2 3 days flushing system is there that is nc every chance of bleeding so we cannot use for next two days any anti platelet or anti coagulant so the it needs a precision like a complicated case like this with all these thing and even if you use diuretic that is the problem because there is a continuous flushing system you cannot separate the what is the urine output and how is the flushing fluid it needs precision of maintenance of the fluid so it needs say well oriented team work to manage all these things so those who can understand all these things and have the drugs available for the heart rate and the pressure as well thank you most thank you dr rajgopal uh, is here uh, one of the senior uh, panelist from the nepal i think so dr sarwari ranjan rajgopal please ask your question or comments anything you put a comments or question rascopal yeah do you hear me please unmute yourself unmute sir unmute i think i am quite new to this subject so i don't intend to ask any questions might appear not so <laughs> right at the moment maybe later as i follow this website with this webinar i'll be able to ask more questions at later all right all right okay thank uh, you dr sumit paul dr sumit dr sumit do you hear me yeah please unmute yeah samir unmute unmute yes. hello okay. am i audible hello. sir yes yeah. yes sir yes. uh, my question is uh, uh, while monitoring fluid in a patient in a very sick patient we can do so uh, for right heart failure by just uh, looking at the ibc and uh, uh, its deviation with the respiration but uh, for the monitoring of uh, left side it's uh, very difficult it's uh, we we usually do not use one gram catheter we do not uh, measure pcwt uh, it's not possible in all the scenarios 
and uh, it has been written in some textbook uh, that uh, if the ratio of left atrium to aorta is more than 1.3 then it denotes uh, fluid overload on left side can we use that uh, in uh, routine practice during surgery to monitor fluid in a very sick patient is it practical no, or not? He is saying, saying that if you got a left atrial enlargement, which is, at, which is a surrogate marker for LV diastole dysfunction, that means the patient is likely to have raised LV ADP whenever under stress tachycardia is there. And if you put fluid in there, the patient is likely to get lung flooded. Isn't it, Samir? Yes, sir. When the and ratio the, of left yeah. atrium to aorta is more than 1.3, then yeah. uh, the textbook says that uh, there is volume overload on left side. And my question is, uh, how practical is it to use this ratio for the judgment of fluid overload in a patient, in a very sick patient with the LVT function? Usually, we will not follow the uh, this guideline. And uh, with experience, very, 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 very delicate points because LA2 aorta ratio, I do not find any higher to follow during perisurgical period because uniquely you can detect many things about the left heart condition. What is about the pulse? What is about the blood pressure? What is the lung conditions? You can see. But if you can do, it can be a part of the research protocol to follow the patient in very Can I add areas. something? Uh, I was yeah. saying that yes. is the surrogate marker for LP diastole dysfunction. Can, any diastole dysfunction I, patient with tachycardia get problem. Uh, but it's not, not fluid overload. So routinely that measure the real. LA and aorta ratio, how far yeah. it will help us? That's the question. Dr. Mishka, Mishka sir, do you any... Uh, thank you. Any yeah, second, I will, can tell something. Thank you very much for asking me thank this you, question. Thank yes, the ratio is being used for measurement of uh, dilatation of left atrium for patient Dr. Satriyo. So historically, that is what we actually learned. Left atrial enlargement can be done for host of reasons. Yeah. So we really cannot rely on this this parameter. This I want to add simple uh, some simple issue. Yeah, uh, police sir. Uh, yes, uh, police. a simple issue is this. Always check the patient temperature. When anything happens, any left ventricular compromise is there, the patients start pulling their peripheries. And that can be by checking the peripheral temperature as well as the, the wave of the pulse oximeter. You see the perfusion wave. There is left heart is compromised, the perfusion is less. So we can easily uh, assess primarily by this wave of the pulse ox oximetry prithismogram as well as by checking the peripheral temperature. Thank you. Oh. Sir, I have, I have one more point. Uh, we can we can examine the internal jugular vein. Yes, uh, definitely. definitely. That, yes. That you can do, but easily venicover. you can do these two ideas. Any patient. A periphery is cool, patient is compromising. Any uh, patient, for, yes. So for, these are the very simple issues. Simple issue. Uh, for the juniors, you look at the yes. waveform. If it is blasted, yes. the wave form. If the waveform yes. is sharp, the sharp. venue is low, yes, yes. that means so the patient is hypovolemia. That's hypovolemia. We, we the, the cardiologist anesthetist, should not see yeah. the digital meter. Yeah. They should check the uh, the wave of the yeah, very important. Yes, uh, sir. Sir, moreover, it can be seen by ultrasound. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's that important. Ultrasound is the machine yeah. we need yes. for ultrasound. I am taking the bedside the job, measurement. The, sir, the job that we do in uh, inferior vena cava can also be done in the jugular vein. If yes. no, 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 we have not no access to the definitely not. If, if we have no access to the inferior vena cava, then jugular vein can be used for the same yes, purpose. Yes, yes. Sure, sure. Yes, yeah, we have a lot of, lot of questions, sir. We just uh, short comments is better. Dr. M. A. Motin, Dr. M. A. Motin, do you ask a question? Just short question, one question and a small answer. You have lots of questions there. Sir, Assalamualaikum, sir. Thank you for giving yeah. me the opportunity. First of all, I would like to thank Alec Jaman, sir, for a nice presentation. My question is a, practically in some cases of our some cases who are stable, with maximum guideline directed medical therapy in ischemic cardiomyopathy or chronic heart failure, having the ejection fraction about 30 to 35 percent sometimes requires low risk surgery like cataract surgery or eye surgery, any other eye surgery. And though the patient is uh, stable with 
medical therapy 30 to 35 percent ejection fraction and sometimes they require uh, cataract surgery mixed as a patients are mainly elderly patient so what will be the your opinion in such cases of patient requiring this surgery patient will need patient is suffering from heart failure and is a stable heart failure so we are happy about that second thing is I supplement. Why not major surgery? Motin, Motin. I supplement. Why not do the major surgery in patients? Why not do the patient stable coronary artery heart failure? Yeah, thirty percent ICM. Why not do the? You can do this. Do the major surgery also. Khalik, 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 Khalik. Sorry. Khalik, by I think uh, out of yeah, network. But what is the what is the? Why not do the major surgery in the case? I actually, think, yeah. actually, if you go through the books, you will find out these minor surgeries are very low risk. Yeah, they yes, do not need a, a too much attention. Except that, please look at the uh, electrolytes. If there is any uh, hypokalemia, the chance of arrhythmia will be there. Second is, please ensure that the patient is not too much anxious because the, if the heart rate is high, that's going to create a lot of a problem because all this reduced ejection fraction patient also has diastole dysfunction, and as Mehta Bhai will surely say uh, in his experience. That the simple low risk operation can, to, can, can uh, uh, revert to a high risk problems if you do not take care of simple things. Reduce the pain, reduce the anxiety, take care of the uh, infection, and take care of continuation of medicine. I, I just want, want an opinion for Khalil, sir, that yes. ad adrenaline containing local anesthesia, does it? Have a very important influence on the heart rate of patient in in the, local anesthetic. The the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, um, the uh, local anesthetic available with adrenaline in, in our setup is a very minor amount. So you can use it, but it what happens? It increases the the places where you, you do not need long acting action. You should not use this because the plain lignocaine quickly works and quickly absorb. But when there is adrenaline, it do not increase heart rate actually. If you do not give intravenously, if you give infiltration on subcutaneous, the dose available in the uh, in our available vials, it is very minimum. You can use this. No risk. Thank you, sir. As Dr. Motin answered, uh, but, but, uh, but regarding the uh, uh, ophthalmological cases, I have one comment. Yes, All sir. cases with low ejection fraction always risky if you do not monitor it rightly. And yes. very important to uh, prevent tachycardia and anxiousness. Give some preoperative uh, pre uh, pre medication to keep carbon quiet and talk to the patient. And the, if anything happens, the management should be available in and around. Because each year we, we listen some of the cases in, in the in the, uh, in the in the dental chamber or some other places, some something happened because the way they give the local anesthesia is important. Even in the ophthalmic cases, there is if surface local anesthesia, it's okay. If somebody is give a, a retro bulbar anesthesia, it's risky. I saw a lot of cases of cardiac arrest because of the retro uh, that is uh, the the, uh, the infiltration cardiac arrest in ophthalmological cases. So things are not easy. So all cardiac case is risky and take care, monitor the patient. So otherwise you are maybe in problem any anytime. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Dr. Shoyul. So one, one, one quick response. One just quick response. Yeah. Functional capacity will be very important. If, if the patient can climb very, up to very third, important. third floor. Very, very important. If the patient can climb up to third floor, easy yes. you can yes. for the patient for even I, I, for. I, <laughs> moderate risk surgery. As Mishka, thank you very much. I very assess good. all my very patient good. by functional capacity. Yes. In my practice, I assess all my patient by functional capacity. Ask him whether he go to the market or whether he go to the uh, a, a mosque for prayer. If they say no, something wrong. So always uh, honor we his can, functional we can capacity. Do we can do 10 minutes. Yes. We can yeah, do yeah, yeah. it. Bill also. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
for his uh, excellent and so elaborate presentation of his topics. I have very practical, although Dr. Khaligud Jaman uh, told many things, but practically we are facing and day to day we are facing lots of problems, especially from the, from the different departments, surgery, gynae, or especially from diabetic hospital. We have a diabetic hospital in Bogota town and uh, there is no specialized doctors in uh, that uh, hospitals and many patients with diabetic uh, and diabetic foods and they need amputation and suddenly they develop respiratory distress. After doing ECG and troponin, he found that uh, he developed myocardial infarction. A patient with diabetes and diabetic foods and he developed myocardial infarctions with heart failure and he needs urgent amputations of the lower limbs. And uh, how can we assess this patient and uh, what will be the suggestion of this patient? I think Adu sir, please give answer. Uh, I always tell my patients, uh, students, please do not treat a disease, do not treat hypertension, do not treat diabetes. Please treat the whole person. The patient, uh, Professor uh, Shoital was talking about, he is diabetic with complication, diabetic gangrene. Whenever you have diabetic gangrene, you have to assume he has peripheral vascular disease. And whenever he has peripheral vascular disease, you have to assume he has coronary artery disease as well. So we have to take the patient as a whole, take a whole of the problem, whole, whole of the problem. Now, if he has MI, he needs amputation. Now, for gangrene, the diabetic patient has wet gangrene. You can start an antibiotic, IV antibiotic, proper antibiotic aggressively to uh, control it to abate the infection for a while, but it can long. And meanwhile, you go for aggressive treatment of the MI. And after, if you can wait for at least five to seven days, then you can go for amputation with clear understanding on your part, on the surgeon's part, and on the patient and patient family's part, this is going to be a high surgery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Professor Abdul Salam, sir. Professor Abdul Salam. Thank you, Mose. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, give me the chance. Because you see, there is a very nice discussion, elaborative. I think we can continue more than one or two hours. Here are the cardiac, uh, cardiologist. Uh, we have We so he, they, they enriched this uh, program. Thank you very much for arranging such a wonderful talk. And also thank you to Dr. Khatmegu Jaman for his illustrative and very exhaustive uh, discussion, including the guidelines. Actually, in uh, fact, uh, we are not following the guidelines. And regarding the aspect of our pediatric cardiology um, patient, uh, we uh, frequently encounter some patient uh, for opinion from the anesthetist or from the surgeon, general pediatric surgeon or pediatric cardiac surgeon. So, you can tell what you are doing. The murgi again are deem again. Egg is before than chicken. The which one will go first? In some particular situation, for a patient with hydrocephalus, patient with cerebral abscess, patient with biliary atresia, patient with uh, we evaluate the patient and one single parameter can give the uh, very good impression that is the pulse oximetry. Even if it is in room air, the pulse oximetry is maintaining more than 85% of the saturation. A cyanotic patient can tolerate the general anesthesia. So we, uh, if, if it is necessary, the risk versus benefit, the surgery is required immediately. So you go for surgery. Uh, if there is no other contraindication like failure, hepatic failure, or something else, or um, the CSS score is low, these are the things. Uh, these are small comments on behalf of me. And most of the Roman Sar, Shapka Dujan Sudri, usually they uh, used to refer this lot of patient to us. Uh, to, uh, uh, for the opinion of surgery and pediatric surgeon Dr. Uh, BK Bikash. Uh, they are also transcending cleft leg, cleft lip. Say for example, cleft lip must be repaired within 10 uh, months. So the patient is having serious congenital heart disease. So heart disease surgery is first or they'll go for a lip repair. 
So this is a vital issue. That's why I was asking a question, uh, as because Dr. Khalidul Jaman has elaborately uh, reviewed the guidelines. Is there any pediatric guideline for the uh, congenital heart disease? Uh, that's uh, that was my question. Thank you very much. I think it is the today's last question. Today's last question. We have also left you two hours, forty minutes. So, Khalik Bhai, is the last question and answer, please. I did not find any pediatric guideline. Thank you. Yeah. But I, I know some specific thing. But within the adult guideline for adult congenital heart there disease, is, a short description, less than one page, is there. Yeah, Particular I, attention to the level of the pulmonary hypertension, cyanotic heart disease, following Fontan Shan or uh, following surgery of congenital heart disease. I think definitely mentioned. Nothing more Thank than you. that I could find. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Arif, any any question left? I think not no question left in the chat box. Sir, uh, most uh, most of the question already been discussed. And, and, uh, we have to wind up, please. Arif, uh, I think uh, Azharul Rafi is with us. He can ask the question. Azharul Rafi? Uh, Do you hear us? Azharul Rafi? Do you have any question? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for giving me the answer already. We have passed two and thirty minutes. Oh, oh, thank so, you. Yes, sir. So uh, already, uh, actually, sir, the question though, which I was supposed to ask already been answered by the different panelists. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. What thank is sir? You for we left, uh, so nice discussion, elaborate talk by the Khalikha Juman sir, and so lots of panelists today. We are so much delighted here. So much expert panelist here, especially Kuli Ravan sir, uh, with us. Sir, can I add the, the Bangura question? Can I give you one comment? <laughs> yes. Okay, yes, okay, sir. sir. Yes. A patient having acute MI and needs amputation. Yes, First sir. thing you should discuss with the party about the seriousness of his condition. His diabetic with myocardial yes. problem, having some gangrenous uh, uh, pathology. And what if the party agreed? Because the septicemia can kill the patient, and even the yeah. myocardial infarction can be morbid one. So, mm -hmm. explain the party about the seriousness of the disease and what I advise sometimes. Input, second time, not one time amputation. Do some sub uh, di distal amputation, painless area, and remove some of the part, and they give the antiseptic and uh, ischemic treatment and observe the patient for one, two, three days. Any patient improve, wait till the, the gangrene ag aggravate and like this. Always maintain your communication with the party regarding the con his condition and show the limb as well as the patient condition regularly. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, can uh, what is that? Uh, sir, please unmute. Uh, okay, sir. I have to congratulate Dr. Khalikud Jamal because uh, he has given such a beautiful, elaborate, detailed, all aspect uh, touching uh, lecture on a crucial subject. We really enjoyed it. We have been really enriched by it. And also the discussions, the learned panelists. Uh, Professor Khalil Rahman, Professor Mishkat Ahmed, and Professor Nazli Samsar, Professor Salam, all have contributed to the understanding of the whole subject. But still, there are many questions I am quite sure that left unanswered. And in course of our practice, in course of our life, we will reach many situations where we have to find a way out by ourselves. Guidelines can only guide you. They cannot give you a direct answer to every situation. So knowledge is always helpful. But when knowledge is translated into action, then it's wisdom. That wisdom comes with experience, with action. If you do not work, you do not do anything wrong. But that, it, 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 is it really acceptable? Only if you work, you will some mistakes. You will gain some experience. And also, you will be the winner in most of the situations. We really wish all of you will be enriched by our discourse and we will put your knowledge into good action. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists.
especially Khalid Jaban sir, laborious job doing. Thanks, Inspector Pharmaceuticals doing tremendous job for last two and a half months. And Dr. Arif Irman Shajol, as well as Professor Abdul Abdul Aziz Chaudhary sir. Thank you everybody. Our next class on uh, Tuesday at three o'clock. Tuesday, Tuesday, which date? It is twenty. Uh, I think twenty-first uh, July. Yeah. Arif, which is 21st yes, July? At 21st July at 3 o'clock. Right, sir. Professor right, Ahmed really will talk on yes. overview of congenital heart disease. The big chapter, I think, uh, sir can nicely discuss on congenital heart disease. Till then, goodbye. Allah Hafiz. Stay home. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you and assalamu alaikum. Police guys, assalamu alaikum. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you